Well, I'm with uh, JP, who has returned recently from a mission he performed on October 5, and he is here with ExoPolitics today to tell us about his mission. You're listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Thank you, JP, for coming back on the show. How you doing, Doc? It's a privilege to be here every time to bring this information. I got the green light, so let's do this. Really excited for this one. It was an interesting mission. Yeah, if you want me to start, I'll start. Yeah, please, uh, just take it from the beginning. Just tell us what, what happened, and if I have questions, I'll just ask them as we go along. Roger. In the morning, I got a text, and it gave me numbers of grids. And when we get those type of messages, we already know what's going down. So I was in a civilian attire, and I got a text saying, hey, go to this location. So I went. Yeah, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning and got ready. I was wearing all blacks. So I drove my POV, my personal operational vehicle to this location. And when I got to the location, it was probably like 40 minutes away from where I live. It was still inside the base, if you know what I'm talking about. So this is a huge base. So we went to this location and there was a total of four cars, four POVs. So they also got the message, four soldiers. One of them was a doctor, cool guy, really high rank. Could not tell you the, the rank and then people can, start narrowing it down you know how that goes so yeah but he was a high-ranking officer so he was with us we went to this location where there was like a little cabin it was made with concrete it was probably 20 by 20 cabin and it was like 12 feet high and the top part of the roof is actually painted the same color of the trees so by plane or by drone, it looks like a bush. It doesn't look like a, a cabin. So it's painted green, army style. So from above, it looks like a bush. So we got in and there was a big door, middle door. It was four of us. We entered, we were in civilian attire. I had my sneakers on. We had blacks on blacks. So we entered and I said, hey, um, so everybody got the text message and one of the guys was like, yeah, man, they told those to come here. And I said, I know what's probably going down to. They were talking about this type of mission before about going to a place to pick up some information, some intel on stuff that's happening. So we entered to this cabin and there were two metal doors and it opened. He, he put his hand on the screen and it read his hand and the door opened. I'm talking about the doctor. So he knew this place. He probably been here more than once. And we all entered. It was five by five. It was a tight spot, but it was on the elevator. And we looked at the elevator and it had 16 different floors. I was like, oh shit, man, we're going, we're going under, right? We're going to the world under. So we started just laughing and talking about it. Oh, yeah, we're going down. All right, let's go. So he pressed um, 16, bottom one, number 16. And the elevator started going down. Lights were flickering while it was going down. It took us probably like four minutes to go down to the 16th floor. So once we got to the 16th floor, the doctor, he, he went out first. He showed his badge. There was two soldiers dressed in uniform did not have name badges, did not have nothing on, but they had a uniform and they were asking for our badges. And we, sh we showed the badges and they scanned it. They also scanned our hands and they also scanned our eye. I never had my eye scanned like that before, but I assume I was already in the system because he said, okay, you're good to go. So. The other guy, the last guy, he got scanned too, and he was good to go. So all four of us, we passed. 
and there was two other soldiers that said, okay, come over. So it was a beautiful, um, it's like a little complex of offices and windows and a lot of computers. There was people sitting down working. In each room, they had like four screens. So there was a total of probably when I was walking, I was counting probably like 18 side by side rooms. Kept walking, kept walking, kept walking, and seeing rooms with computers and people working in computers. It was probably another organization that I won't say, but we probably have an idea. We know who it is. Okay, I have a few questions about what you've said so far. You know, first of all, the, the building itself, it's 20 feet by 20 feet, so, you know, not all that big. But this elevator that for, the four of you got into, I mean, you said it was five by five feet, mm-hmm. and that's tiny. I mean... That and, is tiny. And, yeah, and it is tiny. It took four minutes to go travel 16, so travel 16 floors going down. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, are we talking about like a very old style elevator? I mean, I'm, I mean, I've been in the old elevators... Yeah, it was an old school elevator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it, it it went down fast. The lights were flickering when we were going down. But 16 so, yeah, it was a, floors in four minutes. I mean, that's slow. Yeah, it, it was slow. It was not fast. <laughs> okay. So okay. we got there. But the other elevator that we got on, that's a different type of elevator. But we're right. going to get there. So Yeah, and uh, when you're passing all those rooms, you, you passed all these rooms, you said, what, you saw about 18 rooms, and there was computers in there. So, you know, what were the computers like? Were they modern computers? Were they old? Oh, everything there, down there in those rooms were modern. We had guys with gloves that were moving. I don't know what they were doing with their left hands, but they were moving with one hand and typing with the other hand. So I don't know if it was controlling type of drones or i don't know what it was but i know it was high tech stuff what they had there and we were all just passing by and there's a line there was a white line that we had to follow and keep going straight we didn't stop so the two soldiers there was a soldier in front and soldier in the back of the fourth guy and they just told us to keep walking straight you know we don't try to look side by side but you know in the corner of your eyes you can clearly see What's going on? After we pass these rooms, we enter to another door. It looked like a little hangar. And there was type of flying saucer looking ships parked, but they were really, really, really small. Probably the size of a Corvette. And we saw a total of three. And they were all the way on the ground. They were not floating. They were all the way on the ground. So we saw a total of three. And we passed this um, type of hangar, and it was more dim than the hallway. It had a bluish dim light, and the dim light was pointing to these flying saucer-looking ships. The middle ship, you can clearly see like an opening, and the door was small. So I don't know who was in charge there or which entities were involved but we did see two flying saucer looking ships the size of corvettes they're really small they were parked right next to each other and the middle one had the door open so we passed the hangar type of place but we kept looking straight uh, how tall were, the, were those kind of saucer shaped craft the size of size of a corvette i walk by them and it's by like my my elbow okay so either so drone or a very small person or being could go in them. Yeah, totally. I thought it would be like a type of drone type of ship. But when I saw the little door, it made me think about probably another being that is also visiting the area, I guess. Yeah, I think the, the fourth, the day before, we saw a couple lights. And a couple lights were coming in and out from the base. It was quite interesting because they were in formation or like a triangle. But it was a... Uh, TR-3B or nothing like that. It was separate ships, and they were coming in threes, in and out. It may have been uh, helicopters, but we didn't hear helicopters. But they came in in sections of three, so it was kind of cool. That was a day prior that we saw that. And then I see these three flying saucer-looking ships that can probably be drones or driven by something else. 
So we pass this hangar and we go to this other room and there's soldiers. There's people dressed in black the same way that we are. And they're scanning us again. So we were in line to get scanned again. And behind them, it was like really beautiful metal doors. These doors were huge. I say they were like probably 12 feet high and probably 18 to 16 feet wide. So this was a big door. So they scan us, they scan our eye again, they scan our access card, they scan our hand, and they pass us through a laser type of light that we have to pass by. The security was a little bit higher than usual. I don't remember seeing this much security when I'm passing by. But usually they're like, oh yeah, just go, you know. But the security here, it was a little bit higher than usual. After we left that room, the other two soldiers, they left and they left us with these other guys that were here in the room where the door was behind them. And we entered the door after we passed the security section. We entered the door and it was another elevator. But this elevator was a little bit bigger than the one we were coming down in. <laughs> it was way bigger. We could fit really, really good. And it looked really high tech. Um, it had four lights in the corner, similar to the elevators that we used to go down to the arcs in the Atlantic. But this was a fixed elevator that's been here for a while. It's not our technology. This type of elevator was built by somebody else. It's not our elevator. So it's a different technology that they use to go up and down. Well, what, what made you think that it was built by somebody else? The way that it was built, it was more oval shape. It was not squarish. And the numbers that were on the elevators was not the numbers that we regularly see. It was like in a type of like Morse code type of numberish thing that they had. And it looked like a different language on the top part of it where the numbers were or where the letters or numbers were. I don't think it was made by us. By the way, I'm going to tell you how it went down. So they told us, the guy said, are you ready? And I'm like, what do you mean? Are you ready? And you're like, everybody was looking at each other. Yeah, what do you mean? So he pressed a code. So it's not pressing a floor here. Here is by code. By different codes that you put in, that's where you go, I guess. That's how it works. So... He put in some code and the elevator started going down. Boom. And then I felt like the butterfly in your stomach when something goes down like really fast. And then we were feeling like really light. So one of the soldiers threw his pen up and the pen started floating down. And I'm like, oh shit, we're really going down fast. So I took out my, my access card and I threw it up and it was going down in slow motion. So we were going really, really fast really fast like it was crazy fast down this elevator and everybody was holding on and the elevator was a little bit shaking but and then it kept going smoother until we heard like a humming noise it was like humming constantly and we're all holding on and we're like with our eyes open we're like where the hell are we going oh this shit's crazy so the doctor, he was like, he's done this a couple of times. And he was like, just chilling, um, rocking back and forth. So it took us probably like six minutes. It was a long way down, six minutes. So the, the first elevator was like four minutes. This second elevator was six minutes. But the way that it was going so fast down, it was really fast. Um, while you were going down in that elevator, what were you holding on to? Were you holding on to some kind of like, It had like rails, rails that went all the way around, but uh, it looked like a ring, mm -hmm. a ring with a light in the middle, a bluish light that we were holding on to. So it was oval inside. And the floor was slightly also oval in, like if it was going to a speed, in the outer part of it, it would go like really fast. It's not squared out. It's like an oval ramp type of, it, it was weird, but it was, you know, we were comfortable. 
so it started slowing down and and the dot started getting really excited so i look at the other guy says have you been here before he's like nah man i haven't been here before and i asked the other guy have you been here before he's like yeah i've been here once bro. this is crazy it's gonna blow your mind i'm like damn bro this is crazy all right cool so the door opened and it was a big big cave system like huge so the door opens and we walked two three meters out and you see a big cavern system. I'll send you the pictures of how I saw this cavern system, how similar these pictures are. I'm gonna send them to you. It was huge, it was beautiful. And it had like vegetation, it had a, a river that went through it. It was beautiful. You could smell the vegetation. It had like a citrus type of smell. And I was stuffed when I started coming down and once I hit the air of this place that we entered, my stuffiness like went away. My eyes stopped itching. What about lighting? How could you see in down there? It was like a bluish lighting that was on the walls. Beautiful, beautiful, bright blue, like streaks of lights, like on the cave systems. But it had buildings. But the buildings were ingrated like into the cave systems. And you could clearly see glass. They had glass in their windows and all that. But it was a type of meadowish looking, like if it was tinted windows. And there were oval out type of windows. So it was quite interesting, the structure of the buildings that were there. And then we kept walking and we met up with this group that was dressed in white. And they were Nordic looking. They had long white hair and they had a lot of jewelry on them. And they said, follow us, follow us. They talked English really good, but they talked it like really calm and more from like England. But they talked it like really calm, like, hey, come with us. So we started going with them. The other soldiers that walked us down. So it was a total of four of us. The other soldiers that took us down, they went back to the elevator and they just shot up back up. So we started walking with this guy and we saw a huge, huge dog. It was a type of Labrador mixed in with a, probably a Mastiff or something like that, but it was huge. It was probably, I'm like six foot. So it was probably like his head, like 5'10". Like it was a huge dog. And the dog was also, his fur was white. And he had like whitish, beautiful eyes. You can see a couple of these type of dogs going around and up and down with different people dressed as white. They had um, their, their clothes was like dressed in linen. Beautiful, beautiful clothes. And they brought us to this building that was ingrained into the cave system. And we went in there and the doctor said, hey, wait here. So he went in with the guy and he came out with these beautiful, beautiful metallic books. And when you lift them up, they turn into like not 3D, but like it was engraved looking like 3D. So you could see different types of lettering on it. It was something that I saw similar in the arc, depending how you put the lighting on it, you can see different types of words, depending how you put the lighting in the shadow shows, you can see different types of words. So it was quite interesting, the books that we were receiving to take back upstairs. And he also gave us a type of medicine that they were working on. They were working on this type of medicine for longevity, for long life, uh, to help us live longer lives. So they were sharing this with our government. So I guess they they know the code of living long periods of time. And I was looking at the buildings and I could see similar to what is um, Sumerian letters on different buildings, uh, on the different white buildings that I was seeing. So it was really beautiful, really beautiful city. And you could see really far, but we could not go farther 
but it was a beautiful place and we received these books that we were going to take back upstairs to back to this place that we were supposed to bring it to. So how do you know that the books were about age extension? I mean, did the doctor talk about that? Did the Nordics talk about that? No, it, the books was of the history, how they got there. So I guess they want to share the history of how they got there. I know the book says that the ant people helped them out in a way to live the way that they are living because they're, they're beautiful looking people. They have blue eyes, Nordics, Nordics, um, Nordic beings, totally Nordic. They had a lot of jewelry on doc, beautiful jewelry. They had beautiful bracelets, beautiful necklaces. They had linen with their clothes and they look really peaceful. Uh, they're really organized. I probably saw more than 80 people dressed the same and acting the same way, like if they were all connected. So in the distance, I could see the lighting getting more brighter in the distance of the cavern. It was a huge cavern. So in the distance, you could see the lighting getting even more brighter. So I'm sure if we would have walked a little bit more, we could have seen more stuff there. But uh, I, I would never forget the smell. The smell is like so beautiful, like a rose citrus smell. It, it was like bringing healing into my body by only smelling this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful spot. Man, I, I totally wish people can just visit and see these places so beautiful. And I'm sure this is really deep, deep, deep inside, Doc. This is really deep inside our earth, this place where I went. What about the buildings? I mean, you said that they were engraved or in, embedded in the walls. Mm -hmm. So was it like, I mean, the I mean, there's the Anasazi kind of buildings where you can see buildings are actually in the walls. You walk in and there's the building. So is that, it was is like that what it, was? it was it was carved out from the cavern itself. So it was hollowed out, carved out, but it was white. It looked like a bone color white, like a pearl white. I guess they have a way of shining it up or I don't know. And everything is like oval looking. The windows are oval looking. Everything is oval looking. Everything is round looking. And that was quite interesting because there's a lot of liquid that falls down through the cavern systems and it just goes around the building and it's just beautiful the way they they live amazing the way they live so you know what else did you see in the cavern i mean if, if the walls of the cavern were kind of had all these buildings embedded into them what was inside of the cavern was it like uh you know rivers like vegetation did they had a lot of vegetation. Like when you first enter to this cavern, you see a lot of vegetation. The smell of citrus. They look like flowers, but they're huge. They're orange and they're yellow in the middle, but they're closed. And they peel out like bananas. They look like bananas when you first see them. And the smell of citrus that comes out from them is beautiful. Different plants. I haven't seen these types of plants. It's more like a Amazonian style weather. It's really, really dense with fog. In the distance, you can see parts with different fogness coming down from it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It reminded me to one of the missions I had with Lovent to a dome, to a dome system that we went to. I think I told you this probably like, what, 11 years ago or probably 12 years ago. Yeah, that was, uh, I think, 2015. Uh, you went to that dome or that uh, that habitat, flying habitat or an ark. You know, so we're talking, yeah, seven, seven years ago uh, with all the vegetation. And so well, did, this, did this civilization, these Nordics, did they strike you as like a high tech civilization or more like a like an inner earth, everything, you know, is organic with the environment. 
inner earth and high tech civilization. Totally, totally high tech. Like, I didn't see no phones or nothing like that, but I know they connect with each other telepathically by the way they were nodding their heads and talking to us. I even heard in my head, I heard the guy talking to me and I did not see his lips move. I was like, <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> like you're getting into me. <laughs> So I'm sure they connect with each other. I think they, they're past the development that we haven't gotten yet. So I, I'm sure that they're high tech as well. I'm sure they, they go out from where they live also. Did you see any kind of transportation vehicles? I mean, how did they move around in the cavern? I did not see transportation vehicle. I saw them only walking. Maybe if I would have walked a little bit further in, I would have saw probably flying crafts and all that but remember the the floor before i saw three flying saucer ships that were there so it couldn't have been from them because they they're big they're like my size people yeah but i'm sure they have to have a type of transportation doc but i did not see no type of transportation so while you you and the other members of that small team four of you were there, did you see the Nordics or hear the Nordics actually talk or was it always telepathic communications? We heard them talk softly, but sometimes we hear them through our, like through our heads, like we can hear them. Like if you're like talking to yourself without moving your lips, that voice that you hear, it's not as loud and it's not as crisp. Like I'm talking right now in the, you know, the mic, it's not like this. It's more like if you're talking to yourself conscious, when you talk to yourself conscious, you know, when you're about to do something, you talk to yourself, mm -hmm. that voice that you hear. So that's how they sound when they communicate telepathically with you. It's, it sounds like yourself, con like yourself consciously talking to yourself, but it's not. And it's actually your own voice. But, you know, it's not your own voice. It's not you controlling it they are controlling it so it's like that it's quite interesting so when you went down there first of all and you saw these nordics or these inner earth beings you said they spoke to you very quietly in a calm way mm -hmm. and it sounded like an english accent so mm -hmm. is that like in your head telepathic or was that you're hearing it through your ears i was hearing it through my ears but they also talk some different language that i do not know what language it sounds more like Catalan. I was doing research and it sounds a lot like a mixture of Spanish, Portuguese, English, and French. Similar to what is Catalan. That's the closest language I, I can relate it to. It's a Catalanian language in, in Spain. Okay, so, so the mission objective was for that medical doctor, that kind of high ranking medical doctor, mm -hmm. to receive these books and to receive the technology of longevity. Okay. And did you hear him talking to the Nordics about the content of the books? Did mm -mm. the Nordics say anything? I mean, or did he just open the books and read them and you there heard? Were, there were, um, we were close enough. There were, we were hearing what they were saying and they were talking about the ant people, how they helped them build th that civilization where they were at. Yeah. And how they also are all over the world these same people they got other cities and other places around the world that is underground but it's like type of different races same way that is on earth you know how we got people from africa people from india people from asia you know that look different it's the same thing underground they also have different types of people that they also work together with okay so it sounds like the, the ant civilization that they are one of the oldest, if not the oldest civilization on mm -hmm. the, that live underground and that they've helped others like these Nordics, presumably they were once once a surface civilization mm -hmm. that escaped into the interior to escape some kind of surface calamity. Would, would that be is yeah. that like roughly? Yeah. Totally, totally what these books were depicting. And 
the history of these people. These people have been been down there for thousands of years. I don't know how long they've been down there, but their eyes are like like reddish white. They are totally Nordic, blonde, long hair, beautiful people. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they they started walking us out, and the linen, their their clothes is really ex- like expensive looking, like really beautiful, really beautiful, and. When they were walking us out, that's when I could hear them telepathically talking to us. Oh, I hope you like the experience. We will see you again. And soon we will be also sharing upstairs with you guys. They they say upstairs. We will surely be upstairs with you guys in the far future. So I guess these books and these types of medical stuff that they gave us, to help us understand what is longevity and all that. Because I, I was also talking to this doctor and we were talking about how I seen this doctor before. So I talked to him before and they were doing research of transferring consciousness to one place to another. And I asked him, Hey, uh, wh- what do you mean? Like, how can that be possible? Oh yeah. You got to get into quantum entanglement. So he gave me an example, an organ donor, right? When they, give a heart to another person. Did you know that the heart has 40,000 neurons? So you're basically transferring the memory to one person to another person. So the person that has the heart transplant is going to feel and want to eat like the person that had it before. So that's the type of consciousness. So all they need to do now is transfer the consciousness. But I'm sure, Doc, that that is possible uh, with the technology that we have right now. And it's probably 100 years more advanced than what the civilian sector has. So the way he explained to me really opened my freaking head. Uh, It's true. Like, if you do a heart transplant, you're transporting 40,000 neurons to another person. And that other person is going to be having the same feeling that the person that's deceased had. So it's something similar to that type of stuff. You know, I, I always talk to them here and there about certain stuff and all that, but that's when we're back at that base. We started heading back and you can hear them in the background talking. We got back to the elevator. We have to scan again, our hand, our eyes, everything going back, scanning. We have to scan, rescan everything back to get out of the elevator. We got to the top floor. We scanned again, like if we were coming from uh, another nation or something like that, like if we were going through the airport, we scan again. They make us lift up our hands. We pass through the laser. We scan again, and we have to follow the stupid white line again back to the elevator, pass these guys, pass the hangar, pass these guys with the computers. We went back to the elevator. And we went back to slow elevator back up stairs. Us four by ourselves. Yeah, everything took like around four to five hours. It was a quickie, but it was really, really beautiful and really good, good experience. And I got the green light to tell you guys. So that uh, officer, that medical officer, I, I assume he just took what the books or whatever was given to you guys. He just took them with him, got in his car and drove off. And drove off to you? No, he said drive safe. Uh, okay, drive safe. All right, cool. That's it. We left. So there was one officer, and the three of you were just enlisted personnel. Roger. Okay. Roger. All right. And you got a green light to to share this with me and and with the public. Yeah, I got the green light from the guy that always talked to to me in the base and. He's actually green lighting a lot of other people. So I'm quite excited about that. Oh, um, okay. Well, can you say anything more about that? He's green lighting other people. To talk more about their experiences and to talk more about what's happening. Are, are these people that are going to go through the official process, kind of like, like the whistleblowers, like David Grush? Is that what we're talking about? 
yes, yeah, some of them will go through that process and some of them will go through the process like I'm going through, like through you or the process through the news or it, there's going to be different processes uh, of people coming out. Okay. So, so more people are being given the green light to talk about actual missions, actually, like what you've been doing, uh, encountering ancient civilizations, extraterrestrial yes. technologies. Mm -hmm. It's going to be more out there. Yeah. A lot of people, it's going to be more out there. And yeah, it's really sad what's happening around the world right now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, uh, you know, you've talked about the arcs activating at some point and that there was, mm -hmm. you know, that the Atlantic arc after your fifth mission there, that it, that it moved kind of more into the center of the Atlantic. You know, originally you said that it was going to leave the planet with that Hurricane Lee when that came, but later on you told me that it didn't actually leave and go into space, that it actually went more into the interior or more into the center of the Atlantic. So, you know, what, what, what's happening with the ARCs? Are they still unscheduled to appear? Or uh, are these conflicts, like what we're seeing in Israel, are they delaying things? There's a lot of delaying happening right now because of all this that's happening. But if it happens, it happens. You know, it, it's not going to stop something to not happen if it's going to happen. I know it probably sounds like uh like I'm talking in codes, but I can't I can't really mix in any type of conflicts with this type of information. Okay, I understand. All right, so it sounds like but what's, it's, it's yeah, it is it is sad what's happening around the world, not just in that region. It's really sad. A lot of negative things happening that we can't comprehend. That if it would happen to us, you know, we can't comprehend that. Uh, the arcs right now, the Atlantic arc is run by the Nordics. It's a little bit deeper. Right now, they're running the arc. We're trying to negotiate with them to go back into the arc. But they're like hesitating to let us go back to the arc because the arc in the Pacific People are in charge of that arc that should not have been in charge of that arc, but right now they are in charge of the arc. I'm talking about the, the dragon. So there's things that are happening around the world that it's it's going to be tough when when all these space or UAP start showing up on these different parts of conflicts and different types of volcanoes and they're just going to show up and stop everything and everybody's going to stop in their tracks and that's how that's how I I think what's happening that's why the Nordics got control of the arc because they also got control of the lunar arc as well and there's different ships coming from the region where it's in between Ceres and Jupiter. So we got different ships also coming this way as well. And they're huge ships. Huge ships. There's going to be a lot of sightings of different types of ships. And people are going to have more of the green light of talking about this. I know things that happens are probably negative and it's sad but there's a lot of distractions for this type of information to come out and people need to think positive and think about love and share that love i know that you're going to be going to a conference soon right are we allowed to talk about that sure uh, well this will come out probably after the conference okay so it's going to be exciting, um, Doc. I don't have as much information like I used to about the arcs, but yeah. Okay. Well, uh, anything you want to say to our Brazilian or Spanish friends listening to this? Final words? Sure, sure. 
I'm gonna talk to Brasil. Brasil, tudo bem? A gente está em momentos muito, muito difíceis no mundo. A gente tem que pensar positivo, pensar uh, certamente o que a gente tem que fazer para fazer tudo certinho. Um, Brasil é muito especial para mim. Eu amo muito os brasileiros. E pronto, a gente eu quisera ver vocês, entendeu? Fazer, falar com vocês. Aí já pronto isso vai estar possível, tá? Now I'm going to talk to my Spanish speaking people. Hola, todo el mundo que está en, en la isla, todo el mundo que está en Sudamérica. Estoy muy agradecido, muy agradecido que ustedes están escuchando este programa. Yo sé que a veces es bien difícil para uh, entender, pero yo sé que hay muchos que entienden la situación que estamos viviendo ahora en el mundo. Es bien difícil. Por eso tenemos que estar siempre pensando bien y pensando positivo y hacer las cosas bien y nunca pensar las cosas negativas, siempre pensar las cosas positivas. Estoy muy feliz por los países que, que ya saben y, y están haciendo todo posible para que la verdad salga y estaremos aquí dando más información. Para los brasileños uh, estaremos aquí dando mucho más información de las cosas que está sucediendo, ¿tá? Todo joya. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, JP. Thank, thank you, Doc. Appreciate it. You have been listening to ExoPolitics today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Thank you.